<laughs> okay, we're gonna continue on in our unit. So your next unit exam is gonna be sometime next week, probably a Tuesday. Um, it will consist of chapter 26, 27, and 28. So the origin and diversity of life, viruses, which we'll cover today, and then prokaryotes, which I'll probably spend two days discussing. So a little bit of introduction with viruses. Um, their basic structure is that they have some type of genetic material and it's covered in a protein. They are not considered living things. Yeah, they are not living things because they don't have, they're not made of cells. They um, cannot do their own metabolism and they also cannot copy themselves. They have to hijack a host cell to replicate themselves. Um, a lot of times we call viral particles, um, like we just call them viral particles. We don't call them cells, or maybe we will use the term virons. Um, but like I said, they're not alive or dead because they're not living. Instead, we call them active or inactive. So why should we study viruses? Um, well, first off, viruses do cause disease. And so I'll talk about the Spanish flu here. Um, it will crop up again later on in this lecture, but it was a flu pandemic that occurred in 1918 to 1919. Um, 20 to 50 million people worldwide died from it, twice as many as um, those from World War I. Um, let's see if I have any other, no, okay. Um, AIDS is caused by a virus, so we'll talk about AIDS, but 38 million people I think have AIDS. And you know, every year close to two million people acquire HIV, which turns into AIDS eventually. Um, we have SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. We'll talk about SARS because it's related to COVID-19, right? So, yeah. But these are just some examples of viruses that you are familiar with: chickenpox, hepatitis B, herpes. Um, is this mono mononucleosis? I'm not exactly sure. But smallpox, AIDS, polio, West Nile fever, Ebola, influenza, influenza, measles, SARS, rabies, those are all caused by viruses. So first up, the nature of viruses, describe their structure and understand how they reproduce or replicate themselves. So like I said, the basic structure, some type of nucleic acid, could be DNA, could be RNA, covered in a protein coat. That DNA um, or RNA, whatever, could be linear, like us in eukaryotes, we have 46 linear chromosomes. Or it could be circular, like prokaryotes. It can be double-stranded. It can also be single-stranded, so lots of variation with the nucleic acid. Their protein code is known as a capsid. And that capsid's usually put pieced together by a bunch of capsomeres. Yeah, so the genetic material, because like genetic material is nucleic acids, right? Yep. So it could be DNA or RNA. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I forgot the word B, sorry. Could oh. be, my bad. Nucleic acid could, I'm supposed to say be DNA or RNA. I missed the word. So I can say, I can say, yeah, I can see why that's a, it's kind of confusing. Now, some viruses inside of their capsid, um, they'll have a, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which allows them to go from RNA to <coughs> DNA back to RNA to protein. So they can go backwards with their genetic material. Some outside of their capsid, which is the protein coat, they might have an envelope. So like another layer, if you will. And this layer might be made of fatty acids. Viruses are also not considered cells because they lack a cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. 
All right, they do come in a wide variety of shapes and structures, um, like helical, I have no idea how to say this word. I Wait, viruses or the vi capsid? The capsid, but the shapes of the viruses. Oh, so isosahedral. Isosahedral. That sounds right. Some of them have uh, like a helical capsid with like with an envelope, so that you can see there's the the envelope around there. Some they have like a combination of helical with some type of um, isosahedral shape to it. So just know that they come in different shapes, basically, that's it. Um, viruses are also really, really small. So compared to a eukaryotic cell, you can't even see the rest of the yeast cell here. You can see this bacterium, um, but then you can see that the viruses are smaller than bacteria, okay? There's actually viruses that infect bacteria. So bacteria are also affected by viruses. So viruses affect almost every kind of organism because they are obligate intracellular parasites. They need a host in order to replicate themselves. And the cells that they can infect are, co are called like the host range. So like rabies, that's a virus, it affects neurons. Ebola has a broader range it affects a lot of um, cells associated with the circulatory system, like monocytes and macrophages, but it can also affect dendritic cells, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and they, it, there was even more listed in your book, and I was like, I'll just stop. COVID-19 um, tends to affect like the nasal passages cells, lungs, as well as some intestine um, cells. But um, I just saw, or I read an article last spring about the receptor that it targets, the ACE2, and I really don't know where they've gone with this research, but um, yeah. So viruses, what they do is they identify their host cells, kind of like a, a lock and key fit between the proteins outside the host cells. They bind to it and then they bring themselves inside of that host cell. I think back in 2009, we had swine flu or H1N1. That could affect both hogs and humans. Um, rabies tend to affect mammalian species, like raccoons, skunks, dogs, humans. There are some viruses that only affect E. coli. So yeah, they can be species specific, they can also be tissue specific. Wait, so did they ever figure out like, how COVID started? We're gonna talk about that. I think I have a link on one of my slides. I, I, I talk about COVID again, but I posted some links that I think I'm going to click on and show you. Um, but yeah, the short answer is no. We have not figured out the origin of it, um, which is weird. So when I talk about when I talk about SARS, then I talk about COVID. So some viruses, once they get inside a host cell, they can just lay dormant or latent for years and then they can be reactivated. A lot of times it has to do with stress to the immune system that triggers their activation. So one example is the chicken pox and shingles. So chicken pox is something that you may get when you are young, but then when you get older and the virus gets reactivated, it's shingles. And chicken pox and shingles lay dormant in this dorsal root ganglion of your spinal cord. So the initial affection um, with childhood is chicken pox, then it moves to the dorsal root and it just lays there and just, just lays dormant. And then later on, um, it says when you have an immune system depression, stress caused you know, to it can, can trigger shingles. So I had chicken pox when I was younger. I didn't get the vaccination. I got it on my, and I know this for a fact because I got it when I was in second grade on my birthday and I had to cancel my birthday party at the roller rink and it was, I was devastated. I actually was like finally gonna have a birthday party and no, had to wait another year for a birthday party. Um, and then in college, when I, when I overloaded, I basically took two semesters worth in one semester, um, I actually got shingles. Like it reactivated because of the, the stress. So I've already had shingles. I know, weird, right? Yeah, especially like in college, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, damn you. Yeah. 
So once you get shingles, can you get it again? I think so. I, I actually. I was talking to Jake the other day. He said he got it like three times. Yeah. It, and it, it, it tends to flare up in certain regions. So like a lot of times it's kind of like in this abdominal region. But my shingles always shows up down in the lower abdomen region, not the upper. So anyways, yeah, so you guys probably got vaccinated for chicken pox, um, so you shouldn't get the chicken pox. Um, but we're not like safe with shingles anymore, are we? Like, yeah. I thought so, yeah, because you can only get shingles if you have chicken pox. Yeah, I think you're okay. <laughs> Jack had chicken pox. Yeah, he did. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why Zach has certain like indents in his Yeah, Zach yeah, has like a bunch of like scars. Right here. Okay. They're not very noticeable, but. Okay, so they replicate by basically hijacking a host's machinery. Um, so they trick the host cell into replicating them, and then they make copies of the virus the host cell does because viruses don't have ribosomes, so they can't make any proteins. Um, they can only reproduce when they enter the host cell. If it's outside, then we call it a vuron, where it's just inerts, just floating around, waiting to latch onto a host cell. And so we'll talk about the steps of how a virus infects a host cell here shortly. But two simple shapes that you should know, helical and the isosahedral. Hey, I think I said that right. So helical is this rod-shaped, thread-like appearance. Isosahedral is kind of this. I know that this doesn't look like equilateral triangles, but yeah. But most animal viruses are the isosahedral. And the reason why they have the isosahedral shape is when you arrange those triangles in a certain way, you can maximize the capacity inside of it. So it's, it's the most efficient shape to hold everything inside of it. Um, they say the third shape. So it's like, these are the basic two shapes. And then in this one paragraph, they're like, oh, and a third shape. And you're like, why would you do that? Why would you just say viruses come in three shapes instead of two? So the complex is just the combination of the two. Okay. Okay, so we know that their genomes can exhibit great variation. I just told you they can be DNA or RNA, double-stranded, single-stranded. Um, but it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So most RNA viruses are single-stranded, and that makes sense because RNA is single-stranded. But RNA viruses um, tend to mutate faster because they're error-prone when they are replicating themselves and when they want to go back to DNA and then go to RNA to make proteins. So there are two t types of viruses, um, if you will, positive and negative strand. Do we need to know these since they're like this? Um, I don't know. I am gonna, I'm gonna, I'm recreating the exam and I haven't made it yet. I just put in the questions for origin and diversity and I haven't pieced together the questions for viruses yet. I'm leaning towards a, a no on positive and negative just because I think there's other things that are important, but. So how positive and negative strand works. So positive strand means that the genomic RNA can serve as the viral mRNA, which means 
it is immediately translated into a protein. So I highlighted it green. This is my positive strand RNA. Um, it can immediately be transcribed to a protein, like a functional protein that can make more viruses, right? Like make pieces of the virus. Negative means that the RNA that serves as the DNA for the virus is complementary. So it has to be transcribed into a positive strand RNA, then to a protein. So it has to do an extra step in order to replicate more of itself. So positive strand, hey, you can hit the virus production factory right away. Um, negative strand, you got to do a conversion because it's complementary to proteins. That's it. That's the difference. Okay, so review questions. Viruses are considered to be A, a non-living. Two viruses have an overall structure that is all of the above. They can be a sesohedral, isometric, spherical, helical, yeah, all of them. The basic structure of a virus contains? E, both A, which is nucleic acid, and C, a protein coat. Four, compared to cells, viruses are simple in structure with a core of nucleic acid surrounded by protein. Certain viruses carry additional enzymes needed for their replication. Why do retroviruses need to carry copies of reverse transcriptase? It's C, yes. It's the only one talking about replicating its, its uh, genetic material. Retroviruses have been found to lack error checking mechanisms typically expected for transcription. Predict the likely result of this deficiency. C. C, high mutation rates, and as a result, more variation. Okay, moving on to section two, bacteriophages or viruses that affect bacteria. So I'm going to talk about the lytic and lysogenic cycles of a bacteriophage, which can be um, modeled to other viruses, and then how viruses can also contribute DNA to their host. OK, some background information. Um, I don't think you need to write this. Just know that if, when your book says phage, they're talking about bacteriophages, viruses that affect bacteria. And it's got the same basic structure. You've got your capsid and the genetic material, but then we got some um, crazy looking legs and uh, some spikes to help them attach to it. Um, so, yeah. So, some more pictures of phages. These are all phages. And you can see here this poor bacteria cell is being infected with, um, by these bacteriophages. They latch on, and then they have like a needle or a pin that pierces through the cell wall, and then they, the virus injects its DNA inside. Yeah, this is exactly what, yeah. And this is uh, obviously an electron microscope um, picture to, to show you that. OK, this is where I would start typing. So these bacteria virus, viruses have two types of reproductive cycles. So I'll, I'll talk about the infection cycle. And then I'll talk about the one where it kind of lays dormant and incorporates itself into the host cell. So there are five steps to the lytic cycle infection. First one is attachment. It's also known as absorption. Basically, the virus just attaches to that host cell, somehow binds itself to it. The second step is called penetration, where it will pierce through that cell wall and inject the DNA, the viral genome. Once the DNA is inside the host cell, it will kind of hijack some of that machinery and replicate more of that nucleic acid. So your book doesn't even talk about the replication stage. It jumps right into synthesis. So that viral genome gets replicated, and then we have a whole bunch of copies to make viral parts, which is the synthesis stage. So it will make capsids. Um, if it's going to be a phage, it'll make that isosahedral head, the helical body, all those little legs and pins. So you make all the parts for that virus. And then the fourth step is assembly, where you assemble them all together, and now you have a whole bunch of mature virons just ready to get out, which leads us to the fifth 
step release. They will either lice out, like literally bust out, or um, bud off, kind of like, it's not endocytosis, it's kind of like the reverse of exocytosis, because it's going to, yeah, bud off. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I've, I'm thinking about like people that have gotten viral infections. I mean, it, yeah, it does this very quickly. But then, if you talk about HIV, I mean, sometimes that can happen slowly. So, I guess it kind of depends on the the virus. Would it depend on like the person too, like how healthy they are? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, like COVID too. I mean, some, it's mild, some, it's like, it's, yeah, very quickly. All right, lysogenic cycle, also known as the temperament, or temperate, sorry, temperate. So instead of killing the host cell as it escapes out, they integrate their genome into the host cell's genome. So there's some advantages here. The virus kind of, I, don't, I know, I don't want to say lives, but just can be a sort of active inside the host cell. It can be copied when that cell replicates itself. So we call that viral DNA, or that, I shouldn't say DNA, that viral genome a prophage, um, or a vector. But then once it gets incorporated, then it's a prophage. So you can kind of see, this is the host cell's genome. It's this brown color. But then you see this little part of blue. That's the prophage. It can be copied within the host cell. And then it also has the ability to go from lysogenic to the lytic stage, where it can bust out. But once that prophage is incorporated, we call the cell a lysogen. All right, so the decision for a virus to go into the lytic stage or the lysogenic stage depends on some genes. So there are, they, they've discovered that there's two proteins that are produced, and they compete. Shoot, that's what I'll say compete, not complete, compete. They compete for binding sites. And so one protein will be for the lytic, and one will be for the lysogenic. And whichever protein binds to the site of this gene first determines the reproductive cycle. But just be aware that a virus can flip-flop. It, it can go from that lysogenic um, stage to a lytic cycle stage. And so I like this picture because it shows the lytic cycle where it will bust out and kill the host cell. Or it can be incorporated and kind of lay low. Switch like the
Okay, so bacteriophages can also contribute their genes to a host genome. And it can have a new effect, and when that happens, we call it a phage conversion. So just to give you an example, so you don't need to write, you can just write the example, you don't need to write the <laughs> steps here. So there's this um, harmless form of a virus called Vibrio cholerae. Okay, it doesn't cause disease, it's just, it's just a virus. And when a bacterium infects this Vibrio cholerae, um, with a gene, it codes for a certain toxin called the chloria toxin. And it got converted into a disease causing agent. So now cholera, or chlora, no, I'm saying this wrong, damn it. Loving a time of chlora. Cholera, cholera, that's how you say it. Um, now it causes disease. Most of the time, not always. But. Okay, some review questions. So that does it for the section. Okay. So a lysogenic cycle involves Did you say A? That's lytic. Lysis means to bust out. So a lysogenic cycle, the one that kind of lays low. Close, there's a better option. She said B, the ultimate formation of a prophage. Oh, sorry, I thought you said B, my bad. No, it is D, yes, a period of genome integration. Okay, so it gets incorporated into the host cell. My apologies. Two, when a bacteriophage is integrated into a cellular genome, it is called a, yep, prophage. Yep, C. Viruses that cause lysis in host cells are called, oh, you know what? I don't think I discussed this one. I think your book mentions it, and but I didn't put it in the notes. Mm -hmm. D, yep, D. Right, Shane? D, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Four, bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. Which sequence correctly describes the process of the lytic cycle for a DNA virus? It's it's A. I thought no. there was five. There is, but this is not one. This is um, the lysogenic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. attachment, penetration, synthesis, release. Mm -hmm. And then the final one, because bacteria reproduces asexually, it might be thought that they are incapable of developing variation, as all offspring would be just like the parents. However, there are various mechanisms that might introduce such variation. In particular, how can viruses introduce variation into a bacteria cell? B? Yes, it is B. Viral genes that have infected the host lysogenically may be turned on when the host, um, when certain host cells turn on. Okay, HIV. So we'll talk about how it compromises the immune system. Some of this might be reviewed because we've talked about HIV before. We'll describe what AIDS is and then some therapeutic options for fighting AIDS. All right, so AIDS is caused by HIV. And we know that the first kind of like case that's been you know, studied in depth um, was in 1981. And then in a previous chapter, we talked about how we could trace the origins of HIV back to Africa in 1950s and how it's really closely related to SIV or simian immunovirus. Um, uh, HIV infects humans at various degrees Sometimes there's little progression, sometimes there's rapid progression, so there's a great variation there. Um, repeated exposure 
to the virus um, to people. So some like are exposed to HIV numerous times, but then they don't become positive. Or some people have HIV, but they don't, it doesn't, or it hasn't developed into AIDS. So they can have HIV for decades and they still haven't, you know, it hasn't turned into AIDS. One of the leading hypotheses, and this is new, um, is that maybe it has something to do with the, salt, the smallpox vaccination, some type of selective pressure there, because smallpox has been eradicated through vaccination and immunization. Um, and they, according to the timeline of that, and when AIDS slash HIV appeared, um, there might be an association with it. Another thing I notice is that people that are resistant to HIV infection tend to have a mutation on this gene called the CCR5. And we'll talk about the CCR5 in a couple of slides here. Actually, on the next slide, I'll show you what the CCR5 is. But the CCR5 is a receptor on T cells. And if it's mutated, well, then the, the HIV virus can't affect it because it can't dock with it. Okay, so here's a diagram just showing how a mutation can protect against HIV. This is HIV, and you can see that it docks to this receptor called CCR5. If a cell does not have CCR5 or it's mutated, well, then the HIV virus can infect and dock to the cell. So that's one way that we can combat, combat um, HIV is by doing something with the CCR5, either um, blocking it, which I'll talk about with chemokines, um, or just like preventing it from docking. So HIV compromises the immune system. It targets CD4 plus cells, or a, a T cell, if you will. And a T cell is responsible for mounting an immune response when it comes across foreign particles. So these T cells go around and they patrol, and when they come across something that doesn't identify as itself, like belonging to the body, um, then they initiate an, um, an immune response. So what HIV does is it takes out those T cells, leaving the host vulnerable to a, a wide variety of other um, factors, ba bacteria, diseases. So your body can't defend itself against those um, foreign invaders, and AIDS develops. So AIDS, um, people don't die from AIDS. They, they die from like the simple cold because they can't fend themselves. They don't have any T cells to mount an immune response. So AIDS just means that your T cell levels are way too low and you know, you're just gonna you die from the simplest of things. Usually symptoms of HIV infection don't show for a few years, but there are some exceptions obviously. There's lots of variation. Um, you can get HIV tested. What they do is they look for an antibody against HIV. Uh, and then, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to walk you through the five steps of um, how a virus infects, but then it's going to be specific to HIV. Okay. So step one, remember, is attachment. So HIV gets introduced to the bloodstream, and it's going to attach to these CD4 plus cells. So we have tissue tropism. It's very specific to a certain type of tissue, or in this case, a cell.
Okay, the second step is called penetration, right, or entry of the virus. So after it docks to the CD4 plus cell, it needs a co-receptor called the CCR5 to pull itself across the membrane. So a couple slides ago I showed you people that had, or a slide or a cell that had mutated CCR5. Well, if you don't have this co-receptor, HIV is not getting into that cell. So it needs two things, CD4 plus and CCR5. So this is what the HIV virus looks like in, up close, but you can see that it has a docking glycoprotein that recognizes that CCR5. So it's, they're all over, and they're just trying to find the CCR5 and the CD4 plus cells. All right, once inside it replicates. So the HIV will shed that protective coat that I just, that pink outer coat that you saw on the previous slide. And now we have viral RNA just floating with reverse transcriptase where it can make a complementary strand of DNA to RNA, and then it can enter the nucleus. There it will assemble itself and then go for the release. Um, it doesn't lice out, it buds off. Now, HIV, like I said, it, it affects T helper cells, but it can also affect um, macrophages and other immune cells because HIV has mutated. Reverse transcriptase is not accurate, and so these, res these mutations allow the virus to have a broader range of host cells. So this makes HIV pretty deadly. I mean, it's hard to fight. So can you ever get like rid of HIV? No one has been eradicated with HIV. And I'll explain why in a few slides here. So in the old edition of our textbook, there was hope. Like they were like, okay, we got, we got some new ideas about how to combat it. And this book, it's like, oh yeah, we got this and we got that, we got that. And then they slam you with a paragraph saying, but it's no use. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's news to me because, yeah. Hmm. So we'll get there. The literally like break yeah break like punch a hole through the host cell and destroy it, oh. or bud is the host cell's still somewhat alive but then it will die. All right, so uh, this slide I think is also in your book, but it just talks about the attachments. There's that GP120 glycoprotein docking on um, the entry of it inside, and you can see the viral DNA is exposed, and it's going to use reverse transcriptase to get the DNA to get into the nucleus. And now we have the host cell DNA that goes through transcription and RNA to make a whole bunch of viral particles, and then it will bud off. So treatment. Um, there's, we can treat it at different phases of the HIV life cycle before it turns into AIDS. So we can do reverse transcriptase inhibitors. There's this drug out there called AZT that acts like a chain terminant to halt replication. So I, like, there's like stop codons this is not a stop codon, it's like a stop um, nucleotide, so it can't continue on with replication. We have some protease inhibitors, which bust up the proteins, the viral assemb assembly parts.
we have some drugs or treatments that block the virus from actually entering the T cell or this, you know, the CD4 receptor as well as the CCR5 co-receptor. And one of those drugs is called the chemokine, chemokines, which I'll show you here in a few slides what that looks like. We have some integrase inhibitors which block the viral genome from integrated into the host genome. And the fifth treatment is uh, combination. So you, you might use a reverse transcriptase inhibitor with some type of protease with some type of block-in entry. Um, so the combination therapy is promising. It does eliminate traces from HIV from the bloodstream, but it doesn't eliminate all of it because HIV tends to hide in lymph nodes. So once they kind of, you know, infect the lymph nodes, you can get rid of it in the bloodstream, but just know that they're still there. They're still in your lymph nodes and they, so that they can still make some more and then they get back into the bloodstream. So it's just this constant battle of, of getting rid of them. I think there's uh, at least 34 different um, drugs used to combat HIV slash AIDS. So, Um, I'm not exactly sure on that. It's not like cancer. You're not I mean you're, you're, these these only target the viral components. So I'm not exactly sure. So this is another diagram uh, in your book that you that you'll see, but it just talks about how it blocks entry, blocks replication, blocks integration, blocks the maturity of those protein parts, so you can assemble more viral particles. This slide is showing the AZT molecule and how it acts like a stop replicator. So it's this white and it doesn't allow it to match complementary. So you basically stop building DNA. It's also um, structurally very similar to nucleic acids. So that's why it works so well. This is a chemokine block in the co-receptor CCR5. So it cannot enter into the host cell. And then I just, this is an article um, that I came across in 2012, just seeing how like HIV, one of the big reasons why HIV is so hard to fight, fight is that it hides inside the host cell. So this kind of gets rid of the camouflage, if you will. So the immune system can still take, take them out. All right, so this is where your book's just like, but it's kind of hopeless. So we have not developed a vaccine yet. It's been unsuccessful. Just recently, based on evidence of all the data, um, they're, they're, they've come to the conclusion that it's useless uh, because it can't really lower the viral load. It hides in your lymph nodes. Um, they think the, the failure that they're seeing might be more basic, just something that we're not understanding or grasping. But these are the kind of big three factors as to why they've halted um, development of a vaccine. High mutation rates because of that reverse transcriptase. Another one is if they did develop a vaccine, like a trial vaccine, it didn't produce a strong enough immune response. And so if you didn't mount a strong enough immune response, if you get it, then your immune system may not recognize it and not be able to fight it off. So then they're like, well, let's go to the source. Let's go to the simian immunoviral um, 
um, virus and see if we can make a vaccine from it. And over time, they have been ineffective. They haven't been able to, to cure that as well. So um, those are the big three reasons. So kind of sad. All right, some review questions. The function of the drug AZT is to? C, block HIV replication. Two, copy in the HIV virus nucleic acid depends on? B, reverse transcriptase. Three, blank may prevent HIV replication by binding with CD4 receptor. D. Oh, no. E. E, chemokine. Four, in AIDS patients, the virus homes, homes. Wow, homes. <laughs> in on the blank T cells. No. E. Wait, what'd you say? D. D, yes, CD4 plus cells. And then Western scientists have had an understanding of how to make vaccines since the 18th century. Why has it been so difficult to develop a vaccine for the AIDS virus? D. What'd you say? D. D, yes, all of the above. High mutation rates, trials, yeah, you got it. Okay, I think I'll just stop here, so. We'll talk about other viral diseases. We'll revisit SARS. I'll talk a little bit about COVID. Um, and then I'll also talk about something called purons, which affects the nervous system tissue with viruses. So.